Good morning. Good morning. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Welcome to the Presbyterian Church of the Good Shepherd. I'm Melanie Parker. We would really like to welcome any new guests who are visiting today for the first or second time, or maybe somebody we haven't seen for quite a while. Please raise your hands as I go through each section and tell us who you are. So on my right, over here, yes. So uh, Don and Patty Miller, yes, welcome. Anybody else over here on the right? The center. Over on the left. Well, welcome to everyone. We're just glad to be together. Uh, I wanted to mention uh, in terms of announcements, there are announcements in the bulletin. Please be sure to review those. But um, there is a new members class today following the sanctuary service. If you're interested in becoming a member, uh, this is the time. Uh, or you want more information about the church, this will be a great time uh, to, to come. And that will be where? Where should they go? Uh, should go to the fellowship hall. So go to the fellowship hall. Thank you, Scott. Uh, so again, please read the bulletin for other important announcements. Our streaming worship continues next week uh, and today through Facebook Live at 10.55 a.m. and YouTube and the church website at 1 p.m. Your tithes and offerings can be mailed to the church, dropped off at the office, paid through your bank, or by credit card at the church office. Uh, let's recognize our birthday folks coming up. So Bobby Randolph McGrady on the 18th. Michelle Campanelli on the 24th, so happy birthday to them. All right, this month uh, we have lay ministry appreciation all month, and Sue Ann will be sharing something on that right now. Sue Ann, there she is. Good morning, church. Good morning. Oh, I love that response. <laughs> All right. So, as Melanie said, we'll be celebrating the lay ministry appreciation for the rest of Sundays in October. And in 1 Thessalonians 5, 12 to 13, the message. And now, friends, we ask you to honor those leaders who work so hard for you. Who have, been, who have been given the responsibility of urging and guiding you along in your obedience. Overwhelm them with appreciation and love. Effective and engaging leadership is vital if a community of faith is expected to thrive. Here at Good Shepherd, we have teams of leaders who inspire our members and visitors to keep coming back to worship together. During the month of October, we will be showing our appreciation to them for their efforts and devotion. These are our ministry teams. We have the praising team, of which I am the team leader, the connecting team, organizing, growing, serving, and sharing. And I'm sure you all can see how that matches with Presbyterian Church of the Good Shepherd. Today, we will be honoring the work of the praising team, deacons, and elders. The praising team's mission statement is praising God through weekly worship and special occasions. We ensure that the church has regular kaya, which is come as you are, and sanctuary services. We make sure the elements for communion services are prepared with elders and deacons to serve in both the kaya and sanctuary services. We make sure that the lay readers are appointed as well as a speaker for the children's message. We are also responsible for and so grateful to those who serve as ushers, who serve in our continuing music program, including our pianist and organist, <laughs> the choir, our newly formed handbell choir, the Gregorian chant startup, and special music that's provided. Praising also fills the pulpit when the pastor is absent, ensuring all matters related to the service are taken care of. 
We manage the candles in the sanctuary. Our volunteers maintain all decor related to worship in church. For example, the flowers on display, the banners hung, the beautiful artistic displays created. We manage coordinating Lenten lunches and other fellowship meals. We manage, sorry, we reach out to and welcome any group that visits the church. We work closely with the connecting team for special Sundays. Our dedicated volunteers on the sound and visual team make sure words in the service can be seen and the voices of the speakers and the message of the musicians can be heard. We have been able to connect with our community in worship during this COVID pandemic by having live streaming during our Sunday worship services on Facebook and YouTube. The Good Shepherd family and friends have been able to stay connected with each other through our virtual worship. We have people in our own area as well as folks from all parts of the US and Canada and other countries in the world tuning in on Sunday mornings to worship together and welcome to you all. Our deacons. Being a Presbyterian deacon is a high calling. They minister to those who are in need, to the sick, to the friendless, and to any who may be in distress, both within and beyond the community of faith. At Good Shepherd, these faithful members accomplish so much, care for those who need assistance in their daily lives, for example, getting to doctor's appointments. They send out compassion and praise cards, which are appreciated by all who receive them. They provide constant contact of love via phone for those members or shut-ins who are homebound or in facilities and in sharing the Christmas spirit will deliver them gift packages of joy and visit for Christmas caroling. They implemented our new name tag program. You guys have your name tags? They organize our weekly greeters and they put together our welcome bags for first time visitors. Pre-COVID responsibilities consisted of the collection of attendance sheets or friendship pads and contacting those missing from our midst and might need a friendly call. They assist in hospital visits. They also assist with the preparation of the Lord's Supper and so much more. As the Book of Order puts it, the office of deacon as set forth in scripture is one of sympathy, witness and service after the example of Jesus Christ. Our elders, being a Presbyterian elder is a high calling, a unique opportunity to offer servant leadership to the congregation and an experience of spiritual growth. The Presbyterian Book of Order defines the role of a ruling elder and the qualification of those qualified to serve in this capacity. Our elders as well participate in our leadership teams. The Book of Order states as ruling elders together with the teaching elders or pastors, exercise leadership, government, spiritual discernment and discipline and have responsibilities for the life of a congregation as well as the whole church, including ecumenical relationships. When elected by the congregation, they shall serve faithfully as members of the session. If you have helped in any way with the work of the praise and worship team or are an elder or deacon, pastor present, please stand. Thank you, please clap yourselves. <laughs> All right, let us pray. God, our rock, times of service can be intense and physically draining for volunteers because they don't do the work every day. We pray for your blessing on each of the volunteers you have brought to serve with us. We ask that you set a guard over them and keep them strong in you. You promised that you would be our strength, so we ask you to give each volunteer the measure of the strength that they will need to accomplish what you have asked or called them to do. We also pray that you would grant them discernment to know and honor their physical limitations 
Lastly, we ask that they have the mind of Christ so that they will be emotionally ready to pour themselves out for the tasks before them. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Thank you, Sue Ann. I don't know about you, but I actually, even though I've been Presbyterian for quite a while, I actually learned a few new things, and especially about this church. So thank you very much. And finally, there are a lot of great works there, but I'll mention that recently, as many of you know, I, I was ill a few weeks ago, and I received a card from the deacons, and I just have to say it was extremely special. And it's just not your little standard two-line uh, card. It was a, it was a, 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 what would I say, unique card in terms of it was written especially for me, or at least it felt that way. So, so thank you for all that great work. Uh, please stand if you're able and join me in saying, the, saying what we believe through the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Please remain standing and join in our opening hymn for the beauty of the earth, which is found in your bulletin as well as on the screen.
Good morning, and it's so nice to see so many of you back in filling the seats of the sanctuary. Thank you, God. <laughs> Our entering confession. Even before we speak, God knows our wrongs, yet our rep repentance opens our hearts to God, who is waiting to hear us and forgive us. Let us confess all that separates us from God and others. God, who formed our inward parts and knows our hearts, forgive us. Instead of acknowledging you as our God, we make our own idols. Instead of proclaiming Jesus Christ as our Lord, we proclaim ourselves. Instead of turning to the Holy Spirit, we attempt to attain your way in our own understanding. Redirect our wrong ways and lead us to the ways that make Jesus visible in our lives. Amen. In Christ, we die to our old selves and became new creations. Therefore, we proclaim Jesus Christ as our Lord and the life of Jesus is in us. Thanks be to God. Glory be. Prayers for the following um, uh, prayers on the death of Charles Hall, great -grandfa uh, grandfather and great grandfather of Tyler and Bruce Hall. Tyler is uh, the companion of Donna's daughter, and the uh, Tyler is um, and Bruce, uh, the great grandson is Bruce Donna Hawk's uh, gra uh, grandson, and he's grown a lot. And prayers for Donna Hawk, who has hand surgery in Gainesville tomorrow. She's going up today, and she'll be back tomorrow. But thank God that they found a doctor who can do that surgery. For Jimmy Bailu, uh, he has been ill, and he does have shoulder problems, so don't ask him to lift more than five pounds. <laughs> yeah, please. And for Jennifer Perry, uh, my daughter, Bill's daughter, she has been diagnosed with breast cancer and is going to begin a journey. And uh, she thanks Bobby Bauer, and Bobby knows why. <laughs> Tina Gerald's nephew had a lung transplant on October 8th, post-COVID. Prayers for uh, Pat Meyer, Rob Haxton's sister, and I believe she passed away. That's what I saw on Facebook, so... Yeah, she, uh, they had a lot on there, so our prayers go out to uh, Rob. For Kayla, Danny Monk's relative who had a liver transplant, for Ann Bell who had had a car accident, she's at home and she's here, but for everything uh, around that accident and that she'll be able to get up to their retreat. <laughs> and for Ken Waterbury, Don Waterbury's son who is having uh, chemo treatments. Prayers for those recovering from COVID and those who are grieving a loss from COVID. And continued prayers for those recovering from surgeries, high Preston, and procedures. For our shut-ins, there's a long list there and probably some more we have to add. And for those with cancer, Ann Voss, who's on vacation, John Curry, Kenneth Waterbury, Brenda Fortin's brother, Rocco, Kinsley, Danny Monk's niece, who's five years old, Kathy McAndrew, and now I will take a moment of privilege and add my daughter, Jennifer Perry. And our prayer of intercession. God of mercy, we humbly ask that you hear us as we lift up our prayers as a community of faith. God of the Sabbath, 
who desires to give us rest, hear the groaning of those whom rest is unimaginable because their safety is constantly threatened and they are impoverished of their basic needs. Hear the sound of those to whom rest is a reality far away because their hearts are broken with loss, grief, and pain and their minds and bodies have grown weary with illness and heavy burdens. Stir, in us, uh, stir us to heed your call as church and as leaders, as individuals, and as those who are in authority. May we not be troubled by the mountains and the waves of struggles before us, but may we trust in your extraordinary power. As we wait and press forward for the day, when rest is assured with justice, healing, and love, Grant us a peace that this world cannot give, but can be found only through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. And we'll pray the prayer that the Lord has taught us by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done. On earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our debtors. As we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Hi everybody, I'm Miss Eleni. As you can see right here on my name tag, that's important, remember that later. And I'm here with today's children's sermon. At the beginning of the school year, most teachers make a name tag for each student in the class. The teacher does that to help the students in the class learn one another's names. I've heard it said that the sweetest sound to anyone is the sound of their name. Doesn't it make you feel good when someone remembers your name? 
Even God knows your name. Names are important to him. In fact, I can think of several times in the Bible when God called someone by name. In Exodus, God called to Moses from within the burning bush. In Luke, Jesus called Zacchaeus' name, telling him to come down from the tree. God called Paul by his given name Saul before Saul called Paul, wait, sorry, before Saul became a believer <laughs> and then gave him a new name. One of my favorite times in the Bible is when God called Samuel by name. Samuel's mother Hannah wanted a son more than anything, so she prayed and prayed and asked God to give her one. Hannah promised God that if he would give her a son, she would give him back to the Lord to serve him all the days of his life. God gave Hannah the son she asked for, and she kept her promise to God. When the boy was old enough, she took him to the temple and presented him to Eli, the priest. So Samuel served in the temple under Eli. One night, Samuel was sleeping when he heard someone call his name. He got up and ran to Eli. Here I am. You called me, he said to Eli. I didn't call you, Eli answered. Go back to bed. So Samuel went back to bed. Again, the Lord called Samuel. He jumped up out of bed and went to Eli. Here I am. You called me. I didn't call you. Go back to bed, Eli answered a second time. A third time God called Samuel, and Samuel got up and went to Eli. Here I am. You called me, he said. Finally, Eli realized that it was God who was calling Samuel. He told Samuel, go and lie down, and if he calls you again, say, speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Samuel went back to bed, and sure enough, again he heard the voice of God calling Samuel, Samuel. This time Samuel answered as Eli had told him, Speak, for your servant is listening. Sometimes people think that God only calls grown-ups, but Samuel was just a young boy when God called him. God knows your name, just as he knew the names of Samuel, and God still calls boys and girls today, saying, Come, follow me. So listen for God's call and Amuel, answer just as Samuel did. Say, here I am, Lord. All right, let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for our friends and family. Thank you for our doctors and nurses. Thank you for our teachers and pastors. Please watch over those that are sick and hurt and help them find relief in you. Please watch over us. Help us make the right decisions and stay safe and healthy to come back to church or our computer screens next week. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. Bye, everybody. I love you. Bye, Miss Elaine. We love Bye. you. For our walk in this world They resound with God's own heart Oh, let the ancient words impart Words of life, words of hope They give us strength In this world, wherever we roam, ancient words will guide us home. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with all.
our ancient words today come from the first Samuel chapter 3 starting in verse 1 um, uh, Eleni told us part of that story today in the reading but uh, with the sermon entitled listening maybe it's appropriate for us to hear that passage again in the challenge of listening now the boy Samuel was ministering to the Lord under Eli the word of the Lord was rare in those days. Visions were not widespread. At that time, Eli, whose eyesight had begun to grow dim so that he could not see, was lying down in his room. The lamp of God had not yet gone out. And Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord, where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel, Samuel. And he said, here I am and ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call. Lie down again. So he went and lay down. The Lord called again, Samuel. Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. But he said, I did not call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel did not yet know the Lord, and the word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. The Lord called Samuel again a third time, and he got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Then Eli perceived that the Lord was calling the boy. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. Now the Lord came and stood there, calling as before, Samuel, Samuel. And Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. Then the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make both ears of anyone who hears it tingle. On that day I will fulfill against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house from beginning to the end. For I have told him that I am about to punish his house forever for the iniquity that he knew because his sons were blaspheming God, and he did not restrain them. Therefore I swear to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be expiated by sacrifice or by offering. Samuel lay there until morning. Then he opened the doors of the house of the Lord. Samuel was afraid to tell the vision to Eli. But Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, here I am. Eli said, what was it that he told you? Do not hide it from me. May God do so to you and more also if you hide anything from me of all that he told you. So Samuel told him everything and hid nothing from him. Then he said, it is the Lord. Let him do what seems good to him. As Samuel grew up, the Lord was with him and let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba knew that Samuel was a trustworthy prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh for the Lord revealed himself to Samuel at Shiloh by the word of the Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. From slavery in Egypt, from hunger to eating their fill of manna in the wilderness, from wandering there in the wilderness for 40 years to entering the promised land, Israel has arrived home to the land that was promised to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob and their descendants. Along the way, Israel received good leadership. Moses, who led them through the wilderness wanderings. Joshua, as they began life there in the promised land after crossing the Jordan. And then a series of judges as they settled there in the land over the years. But even after good leadership, Israel is described at the end of the book of Judges as doing what was right 
in their own eyes. This is not a compliment. It meant that overall Israel, despite the leadership that they had received, was just not listening to God. And with this as a backdrop, Israel not listening, we come to this story of Samuel. This story of Samuel and Eli is a story about listening. In a land and time that seems to lack that very same quality. Israel, not so long ago, a slave nation, had recently evolved from a loose federation of geographic tribes into a young nation. Let me tell you just a bit about the main characters in our story today. First, Eli. Eli is a long-standing priest who presides over a shrine in Shiloh, a sacred place where sacrifices are made, incense is burned, prayers are said. He is a respected priest and has communicated God's word to others, including Samuel's mom some years ago. Then there's Samuel. The backstory on Samuel is that Samuel's parents, who were introduced in chapter 1 of 1 Samuel, Hannah and Elkanah, had all but given up hope of having any children. Hannah takes the matter to God in prayer. She was praying there at Shiloh when Eli interrupted her, and Eli tells her that she will indeed conceive and have a child. Well, she does have a child, and she names her son Samuel. And in gratitude to God, she presents Samuel to God there at that same place in Shiloh leaving young Samuel there with the priest Eli, according to the promise that she had made to God. As he grows, Samuel becomes Eli's helper, apprentice. Eli is getting on in years. One of the infirmities which plagued him that we read about was his poor eyesight. Now that I've told you a little about the two main characters of the story, I want you to remember the larger setting there in the land of Israel. Outside the walls of this holy place, the people of Israel in mass are not listening. And in our particular story today, while the characters are not in person present, they are referenced in what God said, Eli's sons. They serve the representative role of all of Israel not listening. You see, Eli's sons, his priestly successors, those who should be his priestly successors, are scoundrels, unmotivated and unwilling to continue their father's work, work that involves, at its core, listening to God, listening to God and then communicating that message to others. Eli's sons refuse to listen. They refuse to obey. The sons of Eli fit perfectly the condition of Israel, that they did what was right in their own eyes. They did not listen to their father. They did not listen to God. And in the face of non-listening, God chooses someone from outside the normal channels an unexpected, unlikely one, a very young one, in fact, to hear God's voice. The times are as dark as the night that falls at the beginning of the story. The boy Samuel is bedded down in the temple with the Ark of the Covenant in close proximity while Eli slept in another room. The boy Samuel hears a voice calling, and three times Samuel arises and goes into Eli to see what Eli wants. We know as the readers of the text that it is God who is calling the boy, but Samuel does not. Even Eli, who has heard God's voice in the past, does not understand at first. Eventually, however, Eli figures it out and tells the boy to listen again for the voice and then to respond to it. 
Samuel starts his prophetic life early in what will become a lifelong journey for him. Samuel will become Israel's first great prophet, listening and communicating God's message in numerous ways and occasions. Samuel will stand out in the history of this young nation as the one who would anoint Israel's first king, Saul. He would also anoint Israel's second king, David. But for now, Samuel is just a young boy. He was not born into this priestly line of Israel. He is an outsider from that standpoint. It's an interesting, provocative, and not always comfortable insight that God is willing and able to go outside the normal routine to get the work of the kingdom done. For it often shocks us when the accepted order of things, the the regular rules, the tried and true methods of the way that we do things are upended by God's voice. A voice that can be disturbing, even to those who are insiders, maybe especially to those who are insiders. Because we are the ones who think we know how everything should work out. Like young Samuel, Martin Luther King Jr. heard the voice of God and challenged the system which had gotten off track. King found himself working outside the normal established channels for getting things done. The courts, the legislature, even the churches. And it is his challenge to the churches which fascinates me most. Part of the enduring power of one of his writings, letter from Birmingham jail, is its indictment of the established church's timidity. And even open hostility to the dream of equality and justice. Martin Luther King Jr., guided like Samuel by the voice of God, surprised many Christian insiders. The letter he wrote from his jail cell was addressed to the white clergy of Birmingham who had publicly asked him to stop pushing so hard for voters' rights and equal access and an end to segregation. The letter is a masterpiece, an American classic. He reminded his brother clergy that the early Christians were called outside agitators when they protested the Roman practice of infanticide. They were labeled disturbers of the peace when they breached barriers of gender and class, rich and poor, slave and free. I bring up Martin Luther King Jr. here to illuminate the point in the story that God's living, active word is always more important than the norms, the rules, the accepted practices of the day. This old story of Samuel suggests that when the people we would expect to be listening that when those people who are supposed to be listening are not listening, God still has options. When those who should listen don't listen, God goes outside the system. Samuel wasn't the son of Eli. Samuel was not born to... Uh, the society to be one that is expected to hear God's voice. That was Eli the priest right now, but it was to be Eli's proper son's responsibility when he passed on. But Eli's sons were not listening. They were doing their own thing, 
They were doing what was right in their own eyes. Now, if you are a parent, I think we can all agree it may be hard to hear a difficult word from God when it comes to your child. God chose to speak to Samuel, to speak to Samuel in a series of events wherein Eli, the priest, is very clear that it is God speaking to Samuel. And to Eli's credit, he listened intently to the message given by God to Samuel when Samuel revealed it to him the very next day. In fact, Eli said, you better tell me. I need to know. God is free to work outside of our norms and expectations, and I contend that that outside work by God is often necessary. Because I believe over the course of time, structures and systems and decision-making bodies eventually falls away from the high-minded intentions which originally called them into being in the first place. Many, if not most, institutions come to existence with the best of intentions, but the best of intentions today can lead to abuses of tomorrow. Because institutions or the people within those structures eventually gravitate toward a self-serving mindset. My God, if it can happen in the church which it certainly has over the course of time, it can happen anywhere. Things get twisted toward self-preservation, and people often choose to do what is right in their own eyes. People are inclined to stop listening to God, to a picture larger than themselves. So with this propensity for organizations or methods of getting things done to devolve, it should not surprise any of us that God is willing to and that God does work outside the system. Whatever that system is, be it government, power brokers, organized religion. In recent years, God has used a rock star named Bono to get things done, which no politician or preacher has succeeded in doing, namely getting Republicans and Democrats to come together to address issues surrounding the third world. Bono made huge inroads in this area. In fact, there was a Newsweek article back in 2000 entitled, Can Bono Save the Third World? Now, when thinking about such large issues like third world debt and its impact on the ongoing systemic impoverishment and underdevelopment of countries and their constituents, who thinks of a rock star? God used Bono when the normal ways of getting things done stopped listening. Bono's Drop the Debt campaign of 2000 gained momentum as more and more people and organizations listened. Thankfully, the church was one of them. In particular, the Catholic Church and Pope John Paul II. My point is that Bono was a very real advocate for a huge systemic problem in the world, and because he listened and responded, over 20 very poor countries were forgiven their debt so that they could better provide for their people who were starving and not being educated. A rock star did this. Well, not just a rock star. A rock star led by God. Bono first listened to God. Bono also listened to these people that he met in economic disparity. 
Bono then deftly engaged others in dialogue, which he was quite gifted at. He engaged others in difficult dialogue, in costly dialogue. Hugh Kerr, longtime editor of Theology Today, wrote an essay um, several years ago entitled, Whatever Happened to Dialogue? He wrote it in the midst and the noise and the controversy that was the Vietnam War. Kerr observed that our problem is that so many of us don't want to communicate in the first place. Dialogue is difficult because opposing factions stop listening and tune each other out. Conversations ends in shouting matches. Fewer and fewer are in the mood for listening and hearing. Dialogue is difficult because we are radicalized, politicized, balkanized, polarized. Those opinions were decades ago. Decades. Long before the take no prisoners, no compromise style of politics we see today. Long before Democrats and Republicans in our country have totally closed their ears to each other, only to feign dialogue when deemed politically advantageous to do so. I don't know about you, but I think we need a counter testimony to all the ear plugging which occurs in our society. I think we need a lesson on listening. It just so happens we have one today. Listen. Listen, old Eli told Samuel. Go lie down, and if he calls you, you shall say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. Listen for the voice of God, and then when you hear it, listen some more. Be quiet. Stop assuming. Open your heart and listen. Friends, listening is a benefit to us all. The greatest gift we can give to another person is to actually listen. To really listen. Listen with full attention, without objections and interruptions, so that we can actually hear what is being communicated. It is a gift that holds within it the possibility of a step toward healing and redemption. Listen. Listen, husbands and wives, children and parents, elders and deacons, pastors and laity. Listen. Open ears are particularly important in our session meetings at the church when the topic of discussion is perhaps controversial and people have different assumptions. Did you know it's impossible to unseat an assumption in your life if one does not listen to another perspective? An assumption which remains unchallenged by closing your ears and not listening will remain an assumption forever. Is it right or is it wrong? Who knows? It's just an assumption which has never been put to the test. Listening helps us avoid that uninformed outcome. Listen. Our text is about listening to God in particular. And as your pastor, I think that is some of the best listening we can ever do, listening to God. But listening in general is also of deep, deep value. Stop talking so much and listen. Listen to each other. If you stop talking long enough to listen twice as much as you talk, that will bring your face into proper alignment. God has made us with two ears and one mouth. The proportions inform us as how to use those gifts given. 
Don't talk twice as much. Listen twice as much. And if you need a handy tool to remember to stop talking, just put one of these guys on. (laughs) And when you feel it on your face, be reminded. Stop and listen to the hopes, the needs, the hungers, the dreams, the griefs, the joys of others. Instead of convicting and condemning Would not the church of Jesus Christ be a more compelling place if we stopped talking so much and instead listened more? In the 1930s, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, a German pastor and theologian, took his stand publicly in opposition to Hitler and the rise of the Nazis in Germany. He was, as a few of you know, martyred at the end of the war for his part in the attempted assassination of Hitler. He was no wallflower. In the 30s, Bonhoeffer organized an underground seminary at Finkenwald for theological students who shared his commitment to resist the Nazis. For obvious reasons, the students lived in a close, tight-knit, almost secretive community. Not an easy situation in any circumstance. The health of the community was literally a matter of life and death. Out of the experience, Bonhoeffer wrote a remarkable little book entitled Life Together. One of the sections of that book is entitled The Ministry of Listening. So let's listen to Bonhoeffer on this topic of listening. The first service that one owes to others in the fellowship consists in listening. Just as love to God begins with the listening to his word, so the beginning of love for the brethren is learning to listen to them. It is God's love for us that he not only gives us his word, but also lends us his ear. According to Bonhoeffer, listening can be a greater service than speaking. Listen. It was maybe the smartest thing the old priest Eli ever said. The best priestly advice he ever gave. Listen. And so, having heard Eli's guidance, I also commend it to you. Listen more. To God, obviously. But to others, as well. Can we change the current political non-listening reality in which we currently live? I don't know. But we can certainly choose to live according to the kingdom of God. In fact, that is what we are called to do. And life in that kingdom calls us to listen. Amen. Please do. Love and pell sacrifice, sacrifice toward every need. That's good. Thank you. Listen. I invite you to stand and to sing with me. How firm a foundation.
And friends, from this place, go knowing God is with you. God is with you, in you, and around you. Listen for God. Amen. Thank you.